Good evening to all. Good evening to this uh, wonderful webinar by Sri B. Sambi Reddy on uh, multi-section distal axial counter, high availability single section distal axial counter, etc. Before starting the webinar, I would like to just take this opportunity to introduce the various activities of uh, our Railway Academy. Railway Academy established way back in 2015. And we started postgraduate diploma in railway signaling and telecommunication with the two universities. One is Rait Bahara University in Mohali and Ramaya University in Bangalore. Till now, we have run around eight courses on PG diploma. And we are again starting one more fresh course, a PG diploma course, commencing from 23rd of 27th of this month. Registration is on. People can also join for the registration. We have collaboration with Transport, CVTC Solutions, and IRSC. Ours is the our institute is a recognized institute from IRSC for processing the licensing. And also we are having a, a trainers to train the people in IRSC different modules. After our PG diploma course, especially the people are selected in different companies like Thales, Tech Mahindra, GG Tronics, Anseldo, Alstom, Railtel, Siemens, Texmo, Scient, Tata LXC, these are the different companies with whom we have shared our profiles, our students' profiles, and they are selected and they are well placed in all these companies. Mr. Ajay Singh is the director of collaboration who established this Railway Academy way back in 2015, along with Mr. Sumit Kanu as a director of marketing. I welcome Sumit also for today's session. Thank you, sir. I am Mr. Narayan Parvadikar, Director of Academics and a trainer in the area signaling. So our different faculty members are Dr. Raja Gondan, P. Sambiradi sir, today's host, B. Surindranath, who is a RAMS specialist, M. M. Prakasham sir, who is the OHT specialist, T. G. Osuru, a retired CSP from Southern Railway. Who also is, has joined us in uh, training the different people. Before commencing this webinar, I would request all the participants to kindly mute, listen to the webinar today's and tomorrow's session. You are welcome to ask any doubts. Mr. M. Kriti Vasan is a IRSC trainer who is now conducting a training on IRSC module A. Coming to the different faculty members, I am Mr. Narayan Parvadikar. Mr. Vijay Velinki is a signaling design expert. Mr. Munnanal Sharma is a telecommunication faculty. Mr. S. Solomon is a signaling faculty. Mr. A.V.R. Subarao is also a designing faculty. Mr. Ram Kumar, a signaling faculty with us. 
we have mr arugam kannan who is a pva expert dr ajit pande a rams expert mr v radhakrishnan a telecommunication expert and mr v s n chenelu is a pva expert coming to our different training programs on this railway academy platform we conduct online courses on rams the rams course we will be commencing maybe in the month of september last week i request everybody to kindly mute yourself when you join please the functional safety training of 16 hours and uh, we conduct the certification course in railway signaling 80 hours course which is a very popular course we are commencing this training from 27th of september this this uh, month certification course in railway electrification 60 hours which also we are planning to commence in the month of october second week of october electronic interlocking 8 hours a capsule training which is concentrating on functioning of electronic interlocking hardware and software designing we have a tailor made courses for various companies presently we are running a graduate engineering training training program for signed company of 120 hours on railway signaling we also conduct project management which is pertaining to railway projects different projects this is our contact number which will be again giving you you can be in touch with us in the coming week from monday onwards we are starting a signaling designers course already 20 plus people have registered for that course we still ex expect some more people the maximum limit of that participants will be 30 30 so kindly be in touch with us so that you can nominate yourself for signal designers course the aim of the course is at the end of the training session you will be comfortable to prepare a signal interlocking plan a track bounding plan and a control table for a double line layout this particular course designers course also consists of autocad designing training and also micro sesha designing training 8 plus 8 hours it is on saturday sundays for more details you can be in touch with us now i would request sri sambhara ji sir to share his screen and uh, commence the web today's webinar again i request all participants to kindly listen to the webinar today's and tomorrow session at the end of the today session or at the end of the tomorrow session we have a question answer session wherein you can ask different questions various questions your doubts to sri sambhara ji sir welcome sri sambhara ji sir sambhara ji sir retired as chief signal and telecommunication engineer a eminent uh, engineer a signal engineer a telecommunication engineer who has done good lot of works on modern technologies like data logger x digital excel counters he is an expert in that presently he is associated with electronics vijayawada and today session and tomorrow session will be delivered by sri sambhareddy sir welcome to you kindly start sharing your uh, screen thank you yeah uh thank you uh, sumit and uh, parvatika think my system is very slow it is taking time huh? mm. yeah
are you able to see the screen yes sir it's visible good uh, so again uh, thank you sumit uh, and parvati kar that again uh, after a almost a year gap i think uh, we have made uh, railway academy as a platform for knowledge sharing so uh, for the next uh, two hours maybe uh, and then tomorrow two hours we are going to uh, talk about uh, discuss about the digital axle counters today session is uh, basically on a single section digital axle counter and tomorrow's uh, will be on uh, multi section digital axle counter so uh, who uh, i am expecting uh, expecting to uh, be listening to me maybe some of them are very beginners so who wants to choose signaling as their career and uh, some others who are already under training so these two are the beginners then some working signal engineers maybe uh, just out of reset or uh, some joint a company and working uh, for the company mncs or other companies with one or two years experience and then fourth one is already an experienced the signal engineers who are working in elsewhere and they wanted to up upgrade their knowledge so these wide varied audiences uh, may find little difficulty here and there some may think that it is going slower some may feel high but the intention is to uh, make you further to be able to refer the documents and then gain the knowledge that is the purpose normally the signal engineers we are many of us are bothered about what to do and how to do yeah 90 more than 90% of the people uh, jobs are like that why it is to be done is the thing which is normally uh, known to the people who wants to change the policies who are in r and d but if we know this 90% of the people who are supposed to do what and how if they know a little of why then they know they have clarity in what they are doing they better understanding of the system especially the modern uh, systems so here and there uh, many ways will be available knowing and understanding these are the two things normally many times i i also say yes i know about share market i know about so on so i know about this subject but there is a large difference between knowing and understanding so knowing is a vague thing it is a superficial um many times what we know we will not be able to make use of it and we cannot contribute constructively in a group for that when we are discussing about the subject when we understand the things we will be able to participate in a discussion and then constructively contribute and we can create value by using that what we know understanding doesn't mean that we should know everything about that particular subject at least the area where we know that we have clarity so between knowing and understanding if we are able to uh, differentiate then uh, our learning would be much better whatever we learn how much we can make use of it by different ways of learning let us say if i read a manual about uh, the axle counter alone most probably i'll be able to make use of 10% of what i know if i listen to somebody then maybe 20% by listening and reading both if i do 
then about 30%. If I attend a demonstration about that particular subject, maybe 50%. And if we are in a position to discuss about that subject with the equals or even superiors, up to 70%. When once we start doing it as a profession, then 75% of it. So when ultimately, when you start teaching the skills, the 90% of it, uh, you will be in a position to make use of it. Now, it is not reading and listening and listening and reading. Now, what is happening is the modern uh, techniques of uh, teaching and uh, sharing the information uh, can take anybody up to 50%, I feel because demonstration and discussion of concepts also is taking place very effectively through presentations. Now, today's uh, contents of this session is about, uh, first we will understand about processor-based uh, systems, then SSDAC, then high available, high availability SSDAC, and then a typical interface circuit, one of the circuits I will just show you. Tomorrow session will be about uh, MS tags where data communication and then some architecture of MS tags. Then the seven MS tags which we have uh, in India discussion about them and a typical estimation of MS tag for a given yard. This would be the tomorrow session. What shall be the level of knowledge to understand uh, this presentation or this session. I feel a basic Ohm's law is sufficient to understand. I feel even though systems are very sophisticated, at the usage level, I think uh, the basic electrical principles are more than sufficient to understand about uh, what I am going to tell. So we are in the era of processor-based distributed electronic fail-safe systems. When I say era, we have to talk about old era cells. So they were mechanical, electrical, electronic. Now we are in communication-based uh, systems we are using. That is why they are distributed. And they are also, as you know, fail-safe. This is the Indian Railways. Uh, about two years back, I have uh, given the analysis of the All Indian Railways failures, which affected the train services. So the axle counters are on the top. Out of every five failures, one failure is axle counters. The many things are all small. A bit, some are their cable and uh, relay failures. Otherwise. 2%, 3% Why is this happening? Is it that the axle counters are of poor quality? Are they failing because of the uh, execution is bad? Are the maintenance bad? Let us have a look when once we go through the whole uh, session, we'll be able to make out really how uh, things are happening like that. Processor-based system. So uh, it works on software and hardware. Because of that, all failure states of the software and hardware cannot be assessed fully. It is called deterministic way of assessing. So safety is expressed in probabilistic way. And there are three types of softwares. One is executive software. That is same for all types of equipments. One type of equipment have one software normally loaded in the factory. Application software, it based on where we use that equipment, inputs and outputs, configuration and all that. Normally done at site. Diagnostic software is the one because of the sophistication, diagnostic software is a must and that gets configured normally along with the application software. To know that the system is 
working with an authorized uh, version of the software, checksum is the one which is verified uh, by the user or by the people who check it. Now, distributed equipment, uh, the nature of them, reliability of communication media of the network plays a very big role in the distributed processor-based equipment. So fault-tolerant networks with redundant media shall be used. Instead of one media, two medias, OFC and optic fiber, optic fiber and copper cable. Then protection against uh, interference because it is subjected to, uh, it is vulnerable now because uh, all its uh, assets are outside distributed. So like lightning, 25 kilovolts uh, supply. So data communication, we should use uh, normally dark fiber, avoid copper and power supply as far as possible use local supply instead of distributed supply. There are uh, pros and cons for power supply. We can discuss also later. In this data integrity becomes very important because data processing is done at a central place many times so by one processor system by getting the information from the other processor systems. So data integrity is very important. Let us look at copper communication cable. Normally what we use 0.9 mm uh, cable, which has a loop resistance of uh, 56 ohms per kilometer at 20 degrees. And insulation resistance shall be more than 10 mega ohms if we have to use for agile counters or for this purpose. And crosstalk shall be better than 55 dB at 150 kilohertz. And attenuation shall be less than 30 dB uh, when you are using from end to end. For the axial counter purpose. What is crosstalk? Uh, remaining insulation resistance, loop resistance may be known attenuation. Crosstalk is the one uh, when there are two conductors, we can see a little later. Yeah, I think we will be able to see. What is the effect of noise on uh, parallel lines? Many times the questions are asked, why signaling cable cannot be used for uh, data, uh, for the axial counter purpose? Uh, this is the reason. Here you can see there is a noise source and uh, it is affecting these two conductors or the cable conductors within a big cable. So there is a noise effect of uh, some 16 units on the nearest conductor because uh, it depends on the distance between the noise source and the conductor. And it is just a little farther away, maybe three, four units less noise is received here. So when a sender, uh, a transmission uh, uh, is here and a receiver is here, ultimately a noise of four units is uh, combined or added to the signal at the receiver. And these four units will be much more than the minimum available. Because we are talking about two milliamperes, five milliampere signals. So, it, it, it is not just acceptable. So what has been done? What is the difference between signaling cable and telecom cable? Telecom cable is twisted because of the twisting. Yet sometimes the conductor one is nearer and other time conductor two is nearer. Thereby the ultimately the impact at the receiver is almost zero. But on what factors this depends? It depends on the actually the number of twists. You know, there are here about three cables, top three cables, you have a look. Center one is the three, three, and then this is five E, and this is the six, CAT six cable, what we use for uh, Ethernet connections. Could you observe the difference? The number of turns are very less here for CAT, CAT3 and CAT5E, they are more. And for CAT6, they are much more. So like this CAT8 has many turns per inch. 
crosstalk is something like when we are using, let us say, the top fade um, for some signal uh, to carry some signal. And then uh, the second pair also is used for the data logger signal carrying. Whatever signal that is traveling in the first pair can leak to the neck, the axial counter pair, and then it influences, it becomes a noise there. And this happens uh, when we measure the voltage, induced voltage at the near end, it is called near end crosstalk. And when we measure it at the far end, it is called far end crosstalk. These are the things, they are supposed to be 55 dB less compared to the signal that is fed here. This has to be measured actually uh, to see that the cable is fit for the axial counter. So these are some of the RDSO recommendations. Uh, when we are using the cable for axial counter, two conductors of the same pair are to be used. We cannot take one conductor from one, one pair and other conductor from the other pair. These are all the mistakes done while uh, really installing the axial counters in the field. Because of that only the 21% of the, one of the reasons is that our installations are not up to the mark. So, when we are using a quad cable, a pair is required to carry the signal of one channel. The other channel, better to keep it spare rather than carrying for another axial counter uh, signal. Wires shall not be paralleled. See, after the cable is out, uh, then the cables are terminated at the cable termination rack, and then from there we extend it to the equipment. There we have to lay tail cables. There we have to be really careful. And paralleling of these wires with other wires can cause induction. Then continuity of cable armor is very, very important. Why it is important? We will see it just a little later. And earthing of cable armor also, these two. Quad cable conductors shall not be nominated for relay circuits. Relay. Because we have a six quad cable and we are only using just four conductors and other uh, five quads are uh, spare. So can we connect a relay? No, it is not permitted. Because relay, when a power, when it drops, it gives a kick, electrical kick or surge of up to 500 volts. It may last for only microseconds but that is sufficient to damage any electronic equipment. In fact, shelf-type relays used to give 1,500 volts. Q-style are a little less comparative. So relay circuits shall not be used in this quad cable. No non-twisted pairs in the wiring, even for a few centimeters. Uh, one twist per inch is the minimum required, actually. As I was telling, after the quad cable is terminated, when we are taking it to the equipment rack, there we have to use twisted screened cable only. Termination shall be clamp type terminals with sufficient pressure. It shall not be screw type. Terminate, terminate at the bottom of the location box. Because if you take it these terminals to the top, the conductor gets exposed to the other conductors where the signals of high voltages may be available. Now about the armor and all, we will see just a little later after two slides. No spiraling of individual conductor before termination. What is spiraling of conductor? While terminating at a terminal, to avoid the pressure on the terminal, to keep the looseness, normally uh, the spiral uh, way it is actually a conductor is bent. It is not permitted for the axial counter cable because it is carried, it is carrying a digital data and high frequency data. So it can uh, distort the signal. 
and a separate earth for cable armor and armor and screen if a screened cable is used armor and screen both are to be connected and screen continuity is very important screen may be available but unless you connect that screen to the earth it is of no use so a, by a very thin metallic clamp it shall be soldered not just tied unused quads are to be terminated not to be left free because they may get earth and then they may carry the charge and other problems will be there and they may touch the terminals where already signal carrying term, uh, conductors are terminated dressing of quad cable with insulation tape because uh, during the maintenance if it moves this way that way then it will go nearer to the power supply wires and shall not be bunched with power supply or relay wiring in a location box paralleling of other wire bunches shall be limited to just 150 mm and if possible shall be avoided in case oefc channels are used there shall not be very high gain it shall be uh, up to maximum uh, 0 db if you give it at one place it shall not be more than 15 db level at the receiver end minus what is the difference between analog and digital signals analog signals are slow varying digital signals are sudden variation you can see just it is rising and then it is falling again falling rising if the electronic circuit is not able to respond to the rise if it is not able to rise up to a certain level before it is falling then that bit is lost that is the problem with the digital signal that is why digital signals are transmitted over copper cables through by converting them into analog signals that is what we call it a modem you can see here two computers are connected let us say we use a modem these are the digital pulses and modulator uh, makes them analog and it reaches the other place other end and again demodulator converts this into digital for example we are using uh, frequency shift keying in transmission of the uh, pulses from one place to the other in ss stack there also the same principle is uh, working electronic equipment is supposed to be uh, really a sensitive so stringent protection arrangements signals are just are to be done so they are complex equipment in case of failure unlike mechanical electrical things you cannot simply keep a probe and then measure the voltage so diagnostics are to be available to attend the failures fail safety as we have already seen that fail safety is a big issue for the electronic equipment there is an advantage with electronic equipment with we can improve the reliability by standby arrangements you have seen electronic interlocking short standby even if one uh, complete system fails uh, it doesn't matter really so these are the factors now let us look at power supply power supply separate power supply are to be used for electronic equipment like ss stack or electronic interlocking because when if you connect any load which has inductive whenever power supply is cut off to that inductor it gives a pulse like as i have told the relays that is why uh, it shall be connected or the separate power supply has to be connected to this equipment especially axial counter equipment if you look at the specification says ripple the dc voltage may be 24 volts but if it is varying 50 millivolts more or less then it is not permitted if we look that peak to peak is 50 millivolts and if you convert it into rms should be less than 10 millivolts that is the stringent conditions to be fulfilled by the power supply system similarly the power supply variation shall not be more than that like normally they 
you plus 20% and minus uh, 10%. So plus 20% is 28.8 volts. Many times IPSs can give up to 32 volts. So we have to take care of that. Of course, uh, reset uh, voltage for the axial computer is 42 to 50 volts. That is the one of the limits. Now, how uh, the cables gets affected because of the warhead catenary conductors in the railway territory. Here, uh, you, you can see the big red uh, bar is the catenary, which is just above the track and uh, it is carrying 25,000 uh, volts. At 25,000 uh, volts, it is carrying it and it can carry 800 amperes. It creates a huge uh, electromagnetic uh, surround it, especially when it is switching, when it becomes 800 amperes to 300, 100, and again 800. Uh, it creates an, any metallic conductor which is parallel to it, up to 116 volts per kilometer. For example, if you consider this as a cable, cable has an armor, and then let I have shown here only two conductors. So all the three are going to have 116 volts, but these 116 volts will be 180 degrees phase difference with the top one, induced voltage. Now the uh, cable armor, if it is earthed, uh, this 116 volts per kilometer can create a current which flows into the earth. This current will be opposite to the 800 amperes. This may be a few milliamperes, but it makes a big difference because the distance between the overhead catenary and the conductor is very high compared to the distance between the armor and the conductor. So in effect, if the cable armor is not earthed and we don't allow this screen current to flow, then cable armor uh, effect is not much and reduction of the induced voltage. So if 116 volts per kilometer is the induced voltage, and if X volts per kilometer is induced because of this current, IAS, then 116 minus X will be the resultant voltage actually, net induced voltage on the conductor. This X, we have to make it as much as possible. How can we increase the X? Number one, by having good air. Number two, by having continuity of the armor. When we are laying a cable, uh, let us say six quad cable of uh, four kilo, five kilometers or 10 kilometers, if the armors are not connected and earthed at the end of each cable cut, then the effectiveness of the screening is lost. These are the mistakes done while installing. So trackside electronics, uh, of the wheel sensor, that is, that is the axle counter. Uh, against suggests if you want to protect, then the SPDs are to be provided. Surge protection devices. They are connected towards the wheel sensors cable, connected towards the data cable, which is going to the next wheel uh, sensor, and then to the power cable. All the three are to be protected. How the protection arrangements are done in general? Let us consider that uh, there is a computer in a home and it gets a power supply from the outside service provider. How it uh, happens, the, let us say uh, a lightning has occurred and we know, you know all that outdoor uh, wires are open wires. So they induce a very high uh, voltage and then that comes to the transformer. At the transformer, it gets reduced uh, because of the uh, high to low conversion. And then it enters into the house. At the house, normally B class uh, protection is provided. And then 
in the room near to the C class protection is provided. And within the computer, D class protection is provided, which is not shown here. So like this, step by step, these surges are to be reduced. Same technique is followed or same process is done for the axial counter also. Now, let us say how earth leakage or low insulation affects the electronic, uh, that is the axial counter. Let us consider this case. This is the signaling element, what, uh, whatever, maybe it is, uh, it can be a uh, SS deck. Now there is a earth fault already available. Earth fault is not that fault that, uh, which causes a failure of the equipment, maybe 20 kilo ohms. Now, when the lightning occurs, it enters into the earth. While entering into the earth, if it lands nearer to this uh, earth fault, a galvanic coupling takes place between the two and the surge enters into the signaling element and damages it. That is why we have to see that the proper insulation uh, resistance with respect to earth and with respect to the other conducts are maintained. Now, coming to the fail-safe. Signaling system, you know, is a fail-safe system, but its subsystems can be safety critical or non-safety critical. Like axial counter can be safety critical, data logger need not be, even though electronic uh, need not be safety critical. So, train detection system falls under uh, safety critical category. So, um, we have to see that this, how this equipment are designed and manufactured to be fail safe. Say for example, is signaling relay safety critical? Yes, it is. But what is the fail safe feature of a signaling relay? When somebody asks us, what is the fail safe feature of a signaling relay? Normally, it is this feature which will not allow both front and back and touch close at the same time. That means when any one of the front contact is closed, none of its back contact shall close and vice versa. That is the feature which makes it fail safe. So, like this, you, we cannot make, define fail safety as simple as that to the electronic systems. That is why there is a standard, Senelec standard is uh, prepared by the Euro, European uh, Union. So this is the European Committee for Electrotechnical Standardization, that is expansion, but Senelec is a French word. So that is, it says about the committee uh, to electronic, something that is a different thing, you need not worry. But Senelec is the word which is abbreviated word uh, freely used uh, in English. There are four types of uh, standards which are to be fulfilled by the axial counter or really electronic interlocking like thing, electronic equipment. First one is 50126. It talks about RAMs. Reliability, availability, maintainability, and safety. Second one is 128, 50128. It talks about software, how software has to be designed, which language to be is suitable for writing the software, what are the procedures to write the software like that. Third one is the integration of software and hardware shall provide fail safety, electronic system. Like in case of a failure of a memory or a cluster of the ROM or RAM got uh, damaged, how the systems will behave? All those things are covered in that. The last one is about the communication. How safety in communication is ensured? Because communication system cannot be said it is safe. Like uh, 
uh, when we are sending the agile counter signal through a wise channel from station to station, it doesn't mean that Y channel is fail safe. That fail safety has to be ensured by the equipment which is sending and which is receiving the data. So how that system shall be? That is about the safety related communication. So these are some few details that uh, it defines what is the RAM, that is reliability, availability, what is the maintainability, and all those uh, processes uh, it provides. Similarly, uh, the programming uh, of the, the electronic system, how should it should be, and the interaction between softwares, how it should be. Similarly, as I just have told about the, uh, what type of tests are to be carried out to accept an electronic system. Now, let us look at RAMs. You must have ordered a SIL4, safety integrity level. SIL4 is the highest level of safety defined in this uh, standard. And it uh, railway transportation falls under this. All our electronic interlockings, axle counters, they fall under this. There is a possibility of a <clears throat> hazard once in 11,415 years about. If it is SIL3, 1,000. 141 years, still two, like that it reduces. <clears throat> now let us look at what is danger, what is hazard, and what is extent. <clears throat> Falling of a stone from a hill is a dangerous thing. That is a danger, first picker. Second one, if we build a track by the side of the hill, then it is hazard. When a train is passing over that portion of the track, at that time, if the stones have fallen and then damage the train, cause the extent, that is the extent. So these are the words uh, and are defined this way in the RAMs 5.0.1 to 6. Now, this looks complicated, but I will make it as simple as possible. So RAMS, reliability means failure rate. How many times it uh, fails MTBF, mean time between the failures. Maintainability, how many times we have to work on the equipment? Because when you are working on the equipment, it may not be available for the service. These are the two factors uh, which affects the, the availability. Now, the availability and then the, this hazard rate, both together gives the risk. And each hazard has a damage level. That level can be defined actually. This hazard causes this much of damage. This hazard, this. Like head-on collision, maximum damage. Derailment, derailment at slow speed, like that. So the risk is hazard rate into damage. Like even if you consider this example, if every month the stones are falling, what is the hazard? Hazard rate is very high. If it is falling once in a year or once in so many years, then it is reduced. And then protection arrangement has to be done according. That's what uh, provides the safety. Reliability, availability, and maintainability and safety. This is 50126 defines how the product has to be developed. I, I'm not going into the details uh, of this, but just for your information. Senelec standard says about safety case that each equipment, how you are proving that it is safe enough. A document has to be made because specification only simply makes statements, but you cannot say yes or no for that. You have to prove that how you are going to make it safe. So these are all the documents, very heavy documentation has to be done. Finally, let us say an axle counter is available for uh, a new axle counter has to be introduced into the system. How it is introduced? How are we sure that it is safe enough? These are the trials 
that are done. First is parallel trail. That means the existing system track circuit is working. Parallelly, we provide the new axle counter and then compare them. Then the series. Series one, the track circuit relay and the axle counter relay are used in series. If the track circuit is working all right and then the axle counter fails, it causes signal failure. So it talks about functionality in operating the field. Third one is standalone trail. This is the final thing where uh, all the operator comes into picture, how to use it and how maintenance comes into picture. So after all these trials are completed, then only they are accepted. If you look at hardware, hardware uh, architecture, we shall have safety as well as availability. Both are important actually. So for the having safety, more than one processor output is taken because if one processor is creating uh, an unsafe situation, it is not at the same time, the second processor also can't fail in the same way. That is the principle. So more than one processor used for processing the output. The availability, we know hot standby, warm standby, cold standby, there are three uh, varieties are there. In hot standby, no intervention of human being is required uh, for making it available. In warm standby, yes, a minimum uh, human intervention is required, most probably like resetting or most probably uh, cancellations, things like that. Cold standby, you require a technician to switch on the power. Now, these are the three uh, architectures available for the processors. Those colors are the processor. Blue and red is two processors. The same input is given for the both. This got two out of two. If both agrees, then only output is delivered. Here, safety is available, but availability is not there. If one of the processor fails, system fails. This is called two out of three. Here, you can see there are three processors and two combination is taken as an output. You can see blue and yellow, this is the output. And uh, yellow and red is this output. And blue and red is this output. And again, all these three are processed by a water system. And if at least two of them agree, an output is given. That means even if one of the processor fails, it's all right. So here, safety and availability both are there. Third one. Third one is the duplication of the first one. That means the two out of two in hard standby. If one of them, at any given time, one of them output is taken. If that fails, second output is taken seamlessly. So most of the systems, especially MS tags, they work on two, uh, two out of three, but SS tag is working only on two out of two. Let us see about now enter the SS tag. So what we have seen in part A, what are the issues involved in processor-based distributed electronic fail-safe systems? and uh, solutions for those issues about power supplies, cables, protection, and protection, and then stringent construction practices of wiring, earthing, all those things. Then we have also just briefly seen the standards which are to be adhered to throughout the life cycle of such products. These standards are made to follow throughout the life cycle. That's why this actually I have kept this. You know, when we are talking about this, it starts from the concept. It is your manufacture date, installation, system validation, acceptance, operation and maintenance, and then performance monitoring. And based on that, we modify it also. Ultimately, we decommission it after 10 years, five years after its life is over. So these standards talk about complete life cycle of the project, uh, 
these products. Now, coming to part B, uh, single section digital Excel counter. You must be knowing uh, many of the old railway people that the analog agile counter, of course, even still now they are there, but I think no more being manufactured. Uh, they have wheel sensors at the boundaries of the track section, which is to be monitored. And electronic junction boxes are provided just a few meters, four or five meters from them, both the ends. And they carry the signals to the evaluator. And the evaluator evaluates the counts, in count and out counts. If both of them are equal, they pick up a relay. This is equal to a track relay. This is the basic thing. Why we have gone for a digital axle counter when analog axle counter is there? Now, if we look at the digital axle counter SS DAC, we can make out very easily. Now, here also same thing. There is a wheel sensor at one end of the section and other wheel sensor at the other end. And then here, instead of simple uh, electronic junction box, there is a full evaluator available here. The counts are fully evaluated here at both the places. That means duplication. It is not duplication. They are independent evaluators of their respective in and out counts. And both of them are connected by a pair of cable to exchange the counts. When the counts are equal, each one picks up its own relay. And this relay can be used at both the places. In the first diagram, there is only one relay at one place. In the digital axle counter, there are two relays at two places. You could have make it made out now. If in case of block working, it becomes very difficult with the analog axle counter to prove the complete block section. Whereas even if we prove it, this relay has to be taken from one end to the other end, one station to the other station. And for that, we have to lay the cable. That is why the digital axle counter has the flexibility of transmission of safety critical information from one processor to the other processor. Both evaluators are processors. They by operating the two relays independently. That is a, what happens in case of a cable uh, that is a uh, the cable fault here. Will the relay pick up both the relays? No. They are not supposed to because in the absence of the communication between the evaluators, the fail safety of the system is uh, uh, affected. That means the counts, wheel counts cannot be transferred from one to the other. That is why the relay drops. But there is a time, uh, uh, this thing is there about 200 milliseconds or so. This is it actually. So in like axle counter, digital axle counter, you can make out. The single section digital axle counter was mainly meant for the block proving by axle counter, where the relay is required at train sending end for the purpose of uh, clearing the advanced starter and uh, for getting the length here. And at the other end, it requires for closure of the block. So both the ends, they are required. And digital axle counters are more reliable. The reason is that the digital signals can be easily transmitted compared to analog signals. The signal coming from electronic junction box to evaluator is analog signal, it is not digital. And very difficult to ensure that this signal is carried without affecting by the noise to the evaluator. Whereas here you can see the distance between the evaluator and the signal processed by the analog card here is within the same motherboard. So 
naturally it has more reliability. You may be hearing a lot of uh, uh, words meaning almost the same, DP, detection point, wheel detector, wheel sensor, rail contact, counting head, counting unit. Sometimes it may include electronics or sometimes it may not include electronics. But when people are talking, uh, you can ask them very clearly whether it is when wheel detector means it includes electronics or only the wheel sensor. So what is happening in SSDAC? First thing is wheel sensors. They are fixed to the rails at entry and exit ends. And SSDAC is an electronic equipment which is kept a few meters from the wheel sensors. The distance is not more than uh, 15 meters normally. 5, 10, and 15 meters, three uh, type of wires are used. Wheel sensor transmitters are fed by the a carrier signal. And uh, the response of the receivers are processed by the same electronics to generate pulses, which is affected by the wheel movement. We will see just a little later how it happens. These pulses are fed to the processors, two out of two at each end. And each pulse is exchanged by both the end processors to decide section clearance. So ultimately, track section clear relay also is driven by electronics in the location. So these are the different type of cards, signal conditional card. It, it, it generates this carrier signal and it generates the pul pulse, pulses. It is connected to the transmitter to give the carrier signal and to get the response, it is connected to the receiver and it generates the pulses. Then you have dual microcontroller that is two out of two system. They count the pulse and they both of them, they agree two out of two decision they give. And then if both of them agree for in count and out counts are equal, a vital relay command is sent, uh, uh, sent to the uh, card, relay driver card. And it reads back also. Preparatory relay, we will cover it a little later. I'll tell you what it is. As I was telling that electronic systems are complex. We cannot just simply measure the voltages, currents here and there and declare it is faulty. So the events that are occurring inside this uh, system, they are, are logged by event logger card. That is internal data logger. Then modem card is required to send the data from one place to the other because it is only one counting head, other counting head also it has to send. Then you require power supply. Of course, relay driver card to drive that release. Two relays are there. Power supply module, different types of uh, power supplies. It looks like this, a single section digital axle counter with all the cards. You can see this is called pulse detector card. One pulse detector card or two. There are two cards. And there are two transmitters and corresponding two receivers. Why two? We'll discuss a little later. So pulse detector card one sends the 21 kilohertz supply of about 30 volts to this transmitter coil. And uh, by transformer action, induction, Receiver coil gets some signal out of it, maybe about 200 and 300 milliamperes when we send 30 volts here. And that is processed by the pulse detector card. When a train passes over these coils, then it gives, generates a pulse. It affects the magnetism. Same thing is done by this also. Both are provided about 150 mm just uh, side by side. Pulses are given to the two processors and both of them, you can see this, how the pulses are traveling to both the ends. 
and they process the pulses, evaluates them and exchanges through a modem with the other end, next station, CPUs. So CPU one and two of one end are communicating with the CPU one and two of the other end through the modems. When both the CPUs uh, counts equal in and equal outcomes, relay driver card gets the message from both of them and it picks up the vital relay, PR. So the counts starts from RX coils by the signals given by the TX coils. Pulse detector cards, they detect the wheels, each wheel, and then give to their processors. Processors decides whether it is a wheel, or whether it is a disturbance, and then they keep it as a count, and then exchange with the other end, maybe at this station or the next station, processors through the communication medium. And then when both the CPUs agree that the in-count is equal to out-count, they send a command to the relay driver to drive vital relay. You can see here there is a event logger and then there is a reset box. We will cover, we will come to them a little later. So these are the pulse change detection cards, CPU cards, total there are eight cards. And the equipment, these arrows, what has been shown here, this cable is a fixed cable. Kyle comes with the cable terminated already. It can't be separated and this cable cannot be cut. And they are of different lengths depending on the distance of the location box from that track. Five meters, 10 meters and 15 meters length. One has to order uh, before. This is how it looks like. You can see the eight cards here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven and eight. All the eight cards. The last one is the power supply and these two are the uh, signal processing cards are the pulse detection cards. And these two are the processors. This is the event logger. One is the relay driver like this. Now, these are the two relays provided just in the same location box. One is called um, vital relay. Other was, is called preparatory relay. Then these are the wheel detectors. You've seen one side, these are the transmitters. These are the receivers. The wheel moves in between here. Why uh, two transmitters and two receivers are used? It is not for the reliability. It is for finding the direction of the train movement. Same thing, CEL also has a SS DAC. Uh, this is how it looks like. Here also same eight cards, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight is a DC DC converter. And these two are the processors. These are the uh, signal processing cards like this. And it looks like this for CEL. This is their block diagram, but some names are changed. They call it SCC, signal conditioning card. This they are called the MLB. So relay driver modem like this. Numbers have some significance, so we will cover it later. They are the error codes, actually, when the last uh, we will see this. So uh, one wheel detector has two transmitters and two uh, receiver coils. So different frequencies are fed to this. One is given 21 kilohertz and other one is 23 kilohertz. Induced voltage in the receiver coils 
its value and phase both are changed by the wheel so wheel sensors are looking like this you can see this is different types of wheel sensor different makes Prosher and Siemens ones looks like this. Wheel sensors are fixed to the rail. There are two ways of fixing. One is fixing to the rail base. Other one is rail web. When fixing to rail base, there is no need to drill the hole. And this is the latest method. This yellow one is the clamp, actually. Yeah. Rail web. When you are fixing to the web of the rail, you have to drill the holes. This is the old method uh, nowadays not uh, followed. Similarly, uh, some of the companies, they are giving both transmitter and receivers are molded uh, into a single piece so that it becomes simpler uh, for installation. Some of them have separate uh, type. This is a, a special inductive type of sensors, not used in SSDAC, but used in MSDACs. Tomorrow we are going to cover about them. That just one piece like this is sufficient to uh, monitor the wheel. Now, what is amplitude and phase modulation? This is nothing but, these are big words, but nothing but how the transmitter signal is affected by the wheel, whether its amplitude is affected or phase. In fact, both are affected to some extent. It depends on how we arrange the coils. This is one way of uh, depiction of this. You can see there is a center means transmitter. This is the receiver. Power supply is given to this. This is the rail. And these are all the magnetic flux in the, way, uh, in the air. They are the, like the electromagnetic waves. In the, and in the receiver, some voltage is generated like few millivolts. When a wheel crosses over these two transmitters and receivers, you can see the magnetic flux has reduced. And that is detected by the electronics. You can see here the same way the, 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 this is the sender and this is the receiver or transmitter and receiver. You can see this is the magnetic flux path. Red one is uh, 90 degrees uh, of this coil. Now when the magnetic flux raise majority of them, they go crosses this red line, then uh, the phase difference of this much is uh, generated. When a wheel passes over the transmitter receivers, then the flux is dampened. Thereby you can see it has just crossed from the right side of the vertical red line. This is the one which generates phase difference between the transmitter and the receiver. You can see this here red and green, there is no phase change. You can see just sinusoid. Here, at this point of uh, this thing, all of a sudden there is a 90 degrees phase reference. You can see here, here, suddenly it raised. And this is 180 degrees. You can see it as, instead of going to positive again, it came down to negative. It is 270 degrees. This is how actually, if the red one is transmitter signal, you can take the green one as receiver signals. Based on these pulses are generated. What is the pulse uh, generation purpose? What is the purpose of pulse? We shall be able to differentiate wheel and a disturbance. Let us say a track worker is working with a iron uh, shovel. It shall not, it affects the flux, but it shall not cause uh, disturbance and then take it as a wheel count. If you take it as a wheel count, then the axial water is going to fail. And also determining the direction of movement. Let us say this, 
first top one is the analog signal. Now, this is actually the receiver signals what we are looking at. There are two colors. The first one is the nearest uh, receiver. Other one is little farther. That means wheel first touching the receiver one and then receiver two. Its value is going down. And as the wheel is at the middle of it, its value is minimum. And slowly as the wheel moves ahead, it becomes normal. This is the pulse what we are calling. This is the pulse generated by the TX RX1. This is the one generated by the RX2. Now, this is the analog signals. These analog signals are converted to digital pulses. You can see the pulse starts here and then ends here somewhere here. You can see the levels of cutoff levels are not same for both. This difference is very, very important. Otherwise, it is going to dance around the same value here. It creates more number of pulses. So the two pulses are overlapping here. This is the must for processing the count. Yeah, this is also another way of showing the fluxes, how they are uh, moving. And then when there is a wheel, how they are affected. Yeah, this is important. Let us have a look how two pulses uh, are generating the in and out count. A, B, D, C are the two ends. A, B is the here, train is entering from A to B moment. So this is the pulse generated by the A receiver. And this is the pulse generated by the B receiver. Now, this caused one in count because when one of them is down, if the other one is up, normally that is taken as a count. So this count is, that is one of the factors apart from all other things, the levels of this pulse, everything is taken care of and uh, taken into account. So since a signal has the first pulse started from the A, direction is treated as in count. Now here you can see the same direction it is coming the train uh, from A to B it has come and then after a kilometer or so now it is entering the D and then C is going out. So you can see the D is this and then this is the C, two pulses. This causes the out count, one in count, one out count. So Two sensors are provided for each wheel detection point for the purpose of direction determination. For more analytical, uh, this thing, how the uh, pulses are uh, generated, we can even make it into a five phases. The same wheel, these are the two uh, trans, trans, one is transmitter, other receiver, transmitter, receiver, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Wheel is far away, so both are not affected. A wheel has come nearer to one, so one is down. Then little later, it has come to the two, then two is also down. When both are down, this is the air position. This is phase three. And then phase four, the sensor one uh, has picked up, receiver voltage has gone up, and uh, little later, sensor two. So like this, there are five phases. Phase one and phase five are same. And in between, there are three phases. All these pulses are processed by the pulse detector and given to the processors. Trolley suppression is a very important thing. Uh, trolley suppression, uh, we said, the axle counter wheel detector has to detect only the trains, not the shovels or the some uh, metallic things carried by the workers or the small vehicles which are lifted from the track like trolleys. If they start counting, then they also fail. So that is why there are methods, different methods used. Now, uh, 
in amplitude modulation olden days n log axial counter stalli suppression dc track circuit was used as per the new scm also now it is not permitted no track circuit shall be used for the purpose of stalli suppression it has to be generated by the system itself no separate arrangements are to be made this is the old system there used to be a track circuit of about 5 uh, 6 rail lengths on both the ends now how uh, the trolley is uh, not detected you can see by this time you know how the pulses are generated this is the first pulse that means first sensor pulse this is the second sensor pulse for a train we have seen it just now and this is where we do the counting there is a overlapping of the signals from both the receivers you can see this this is for a trolley trolley wheel is small so its influence will not be from far away so the pulse has stopped here itself the first sensor pulse has stopped here itself only after some time the second pulse started so by making use of this gap and of course the value of the signal the trolley wheel is detected as a trolley wheel and then disregarded for the purpose of counting this one uh, last one is the one where a dip lorry you must be knowing those material lorries used by the engineering people uh, track people uh, they are not detected at all no pulse is generated this is how uh, in the present uh, ss dac the trolley suppression is uh, provided now trolleys also are uh, having different uh, wheels you can see the top one it has more iron in this steel and it impacts the flux magnetic flux that is why uh, this type of uh, spoke wheels are supposed to be used uh, in the areas where axial counters are provided by the civil engineers reset why reset has to be done uh there the different reasons number 1 transients many times they suggest they won't cause permanent failure they just causes a momentary failure and then system comes back but again because it is a fail safe system you you what happened during that micro seconds or milliseconds uh, since it is not known the system will not be available for usage number 2 restoration after hardware failure when once the system fails let us say you have simply replaced the cpu card if there is already a train available there so it cannot simply show clear so to bring it back to life reset has to be done unusual vehicles that is rds was specials these are the ones which generates um electromagnetic waves and which influences with the which influences the wheels that is wheel sensors so there also after passage of the strain reset has to be applied unusual movements that is shunting while doing the shunting let us say instead of a b channels only a channel it touches and comes back then what is to be done shall it be considered as a count or not these are the unusual movements in some cases there is a i think concession at present if single wheel sensor is traversed for up to two times i think uh, it won't fail if it is more than two times then it goes into a failure mode what happens is when uh, reset is done 48 volt dc supply is uh, applied to the ss stack
why uh, it is dangerous reset here is an example in fact uh, when we are talking about indian railways there can be uh, trains with different wheel uh, numbers different lengths different number of vehicles wagons or coaches but in uh, systems like metros uh, you have uh, standard uh, eight or nine coaches or maybe four coaches uh, in one train and uh, you can't differentiate by the number of wheels each train in this example you can see train number 1 is between 13 and 15 there are 24 axles so 24 axles are counted and then present also there are 24 axles are there now at this particular point of time the axle counter has somebody said it has failed and then it has to be permitted so somebody used his uh, discretion and then reset it when reset is done what happens the axle counter says zero, and then actually there are 24 coaches. Then the train enters into the section. Now, how many are there? 24 are counted, and 48 are available. Meantime, let us say number one train has crossed the signal, 15, gone. Now, with the train in the four, train number two in the section, the, since 24 uh, uh, are, uh, wheels are out, the counting is become zero. But still, there are 24 wheels available, belonging to number two. This has happened because reset was done when still the section was occupied by a train. This counting has become zero. That is why two types of uh, resets are uh, provided. One is conditional resets, other one is preparatory reset. Conditional reset is hard reset with cooperation. Hard reset means immediately it becomes clear. And second person is required here. Not one person cannot do this. One more person is required. Normally this is provided on sections where full trains like the train cannot be accommodated, like point zones, there is a very less likelihood of that getting occupied. Or loop lines where uh, the train speeds are so less that likelihood of a collision is very less. Second one is preparatory reset is provided uh, where when the reset is applied, uh, the axle counter says that yes, it is all right. But the thing is, one more one train has to be sent through the section before it is made use of. That means this one train passage clearly ensures that there is no other vehicle in the section, number one. Number two, the system also is functioning correctly. The dynamic faults are not there. So preparatory reset is only used for the SSDAC when used for the block proving by axle counter. When it is used for the loop lines proving, it can be used, uh, the conditional reset or hard reset can be used. This is the latest signal engineering manuals uh, extract I have just shown the same thing. Reset box looks like this. It Since it has to be done by the station master, uh, there is a key available, which is kept under his personal custody. And then he inserts it and turns it to the right side. And uh, this is the button which he has to press. Here comes the wheel counts of each end in the LCD panel. And whether section is clear or occupied is given by the two uh, indications. And the preparatory reset is provided by these indications. And each reset is counted by a counter. So we can say um, SSDAC has four states. Clear and occupied normally happens. 
when train is out it goes to the clear when train enters into the section it occupies so vr and relay is up and a pr relay is down preparatory relay set when train enters into the section vr also dropped and pr anyhow is in the dropped condition let us say at this point of time because of some problem the fault occurred then the axial counter goes into the disturbed mode which is in the red block you please observe the relays are remaining in the same position but equipment has failed now from here when preparatory reset is done then vr relay is still in down condition only pr relay picks up saying that the equipment is in a preparatory reset mode It's ready to accept a train when the train enters and clears if there is no failure of the equipment it reaches clear but if there is a problem the dynamic problem has repeated when the first train is dead again it goes into disturbed mode it's like this the challenge is actually uh, occupied and disturbed modes we cannot differentiate by simple vr and pr relays so what type of cables and power supplies have to be used it works on just one power supply 24 volt dc from the ips that is sufficient if this is the this is deck of one end it is connected to the two transmitters and two receivers by the communication cable this cable comes along with the wheel detector coils there is uh, no need to separately provide that can't be provided and uh, this is the one which exchanges the current with the other end ss dac it is a communication cable and a power cable come uh, of 24 volt dc and a 48 volt dc reset voltage it is received here from the reset box and vr and pr are the two relays we have seen before that which are available by the side of the ss dac they are repeated to the station for the interlocking purpose then what is this other communication cable to the reset box this is the one which provides the data of the counts to the yeah this one yeah here let us say you have seen here section clear section not clear then number of wheels inside this information is provided by the reset box through the cable communication cable from the event logger of the ss dac so these are the different type of cables just i have already covered dummy wheel is the one which substitutes for a wheel for the purpose of initial adjustment or testing or whenever you change the tx or x files it is nothing but a aluminum type of a material uh, which uh, simulates which cuts the flux and it is moved over the rail uh, simulating the wheel movement and a little adjustment has to be done for the purpose of uh, 90 or 60 kg rails because it depends on the height of the wheel that the or height of the <coughs> rail from the tx and r axis similarly uh, when a, when this adjustment is being done the values are measured at the signal conditioning card between these two when the wheel is occupied and when it is wheel is uh, without wheel these are the values it is supposed to give until such time adjustment has to be done to the wheel uh, the sensors these are the power supply 5 volt 12 volts 24 things like this different voltages 
Now, because these are electronic processor based equipments, they generate data, exchange data. How are we sure that this data is coming only from that particular place? Is it coming from this particular wheel sensor or some other wheel sensor? For that purpose, safety reason and functional purposes, configuration has to be done for both counting unit as well as in the CPUs also. For example, JZtronic says uh, uh, sending end and then exit end. Uh, so like this, so one place in the CPU module uh, address is set for uh, the, to make it as a start, oh sorry, it is start fed and end fed. Um, exit and entry is done in the CEM. So start fed and end fed uh, is given for the uh, wheel counting unit. And for the CPU, it is given uh, another, uh, code in the same CPU it is uh, marked actually. Now, electronic equipment, as we have said, uh, it has to provide its health through data, but many times uh, to access the data, you require again a processor based system. Instead of that, on the card itself, they provide certain diagnostics. Like you can, TP, uh, pulse OK is a green LED. When it is on, uh, <clears throat> there is a signal from RX when pulse level is card is OK, off with uh, RX coil is faulty or when it is wrongly connected or disconnected. So using these LEDs, it is possible to find out the problem with the cards and then replace them. Similarly, these are the micro uh, processor cards. Modem card, DC DC converter card, relay driver card. So some of them say the condition, some of them say about the parts, both. Errors are given, not in the diagnosis, uh, not in the digital numbers, but through LEDs. And each LED has a value actually when it is lit. For example, there, there are eight LEDs. Some of them lit. When, for example, uh, this, uh, this LED, third LED is lit, its value is four. If the fifth LED is lit, you have to consider it as 10. And these values are added, and then the number is uh, arrived at. For example, uh, in one of the Failure, uh, failure case, uh, one and three are lit, one and three. And similarly, five and six are lit. So what should be the number? One and three means one plus four, five. And five and six means 10 plus 20, 30, 35. This gives the second digit, the top one gives the first digit, like this. Based on that, then uh, it is given in the manual, like 34 error means this uh, three are late. 35 means just now we have seen these four are late, red LEDs. These are LEDs are in the uh, CPU card. So it gives what is to be done. This gives the reason, then it gives the what uh, the action to be taken by the maintenance person. Similarly, GGtronics as a deck also provides a similar uh, thing, uh, what is to be done. But here, uh, I think error codes, they directly display the number. This is for uh, CEL. Now, uh, part C, high availability SS deck. What is high availability SS deck? Now, high availability SS DAG is nothing but redundancy of the two uh, SS DAGs. 
again, coming back to the same axial counters, failures of one in uh, five failures are axial counters. So uh, these failures caused a lot of concern. And then to find out first, uh, to find a quicker solution, one of the thing is redundancy. As we have already seen that electronics um, easily supports the redundancy. So um, the limitations of SS DAC, single section digital axial counter is overcome by going for a redundant thing. So first what has been done is the two separate SS DACs are provided as you can see two boxes and they have their own reset boxes and a common reset box was provided in SM room, keeping both of them like this. Later, now the present high availability SS DAC has in a single cabinet, the both the counting systems and then a common reset box. This improved the reliability. There is a version where the duplication is done only for the electronics portion and uh, this communication portion, and it is left to the wheel detector. I don't think this is an advisable thing, but these models are available. When we are providing a second uh, SS DAC on the same track, then we have to take care of uh, influencing of flux by one another. That is why a minimum of two meters has to be kept between the two. Again, it cannot be maximum also because otherwise the section being monitored, that value uh, changes. So it is kept at just two meters. Now, this is how it looks like. What we have seen a single processor based system now, you can see the red and then a green one. Both are uh, being uh, integrated into just one box. So these are the signal processing cards. These two are the processor cards, CPUs. Uh, maybe one is the event logger. Then this is the modem, then relay driver. Similar, uh, similarly, this is the DC DC. Uh, I think uh, DC DC converter is here. Yeah, like this. So the same eight cards are accommodated uh, on the one off, another eight cards in the other off. They look like this. This is one station, this is the other station. You can see the two quad cables differently. Even if one of them fails, other one will take care of it. So the different uh, reset panel from reset 48 volts comes to the CPUs of both of them. And only the one which has, uh, uh, which uh, is in failed state accepts it otherwise, otherwise it won't uh, be effective. Similarly, the SM CPU is the one which gives the signal or the event logger count of the wheels for the display in the reset panel. And 24 volt DC is given directly to the DC DC converters. It's like this. And here you can see the each one is having its own transmitter and receiver guides. So this is the full fledged uh, high availability SS DAC showing all the equipments and cables uh, involved at both the ends. Now, because we are monitoring the same section by two processor based systems, it is possible to provide auto reset. 
So there is a facility for both auto reset as well as a manual reset. Auto reset is carried out uh, at the equipment level itself, whereas manual reset still remains as it is with the station master. As we have already seen, uh, I told that when reset is done, 48 volt DC supply is applied to the test stack. We can see this actually how it happens, auto reset. Uh, this is for the digitronics one. Uh, there is a small electronics uh, card. Uh, this is called reset pulse generator. Now, it works on 24 volt DC and it is provided in reset box. You can see <clears throat> VR and PR are the two relays. And uh, because there are uh, dual ones, VPR, VR1, VR2, two relays will be there. PR1, PR2, another two, total four relays will be there. All the four are repeated to the station as repeaters, VPR1, VPR2, PPR1 and PPR2. You can observe this path. One of the VPRs is up, VPR2 is up, but VPR1 is down. And the second path, here VPR1 is up, but VPR2 is down. This is a double cutting here, but don't bother. Same thing is proved. This situation occurs because both ISIL counters won't uh, pick up and drop at the same time uh, they release. Both ISIL counters cannot because still few milliseconds uh, time difference will be there. Depending on the train movement, sometimes if it is very slow, uh, it can be going to one or two seconds also. That is why whenever this situation occurs, VPR1 and down and VPR2 up, or VPR2 down and VPR1 up. This condition is applied to a reset uh, pulse generator. And if this continues for 10 seconds, then only it generates a pulse. And that pulse picks up RTSR. Then that pulse width will be up to five seconds only, not more than that, five or six seconds. So five to six seconds RTSR relay picks up and this RTSR relay applies 48 volts to the system in the location. So what we are seeing is here, this dotted one, this is the location and remaining thing is station uh, house. That is the, uh, that is the relay room. In the relay room, you have VPR, PPRs, which are repeated. And uh, reset pulse generator takes input from them and uh, picks up a relay, RTSR. And also, it uh, the reset count is also increased. And then it applies the reset. And you can see this is bypassed by SM's key and reset push button. That means manual. This path is straight path is auto reset and the loop one is the manual reset. Because high availability SS DAC has a two systems. So it shows each SS DAC its status. So it's PR layup or uh, uh, preparatory set move, uh, mode or clear mode or occupied mode and number of wheels counts at each place. Yeah. This is how at the site the equipment is. This is uh, how uh, CL equipment looks like, just a little different from this. There is no, but the same cards. And it's um, functions also you can see in the same way, the cards. Here there is a difference, actually a little difference. 
the reset is done at the location itself. Reset relay is picked up at the location box itself and it applies there only. And that is why actually the you can see the counters in the location box itself. Another precaution uh, while fixing the uh, units is that both the ends, entry end and exit end, they have to be fixed on the same rail. Because if there is any deformity in one of the axles, it happens in the same way. That is the reason. Remote condition monitoring of this. We have seen this slide before. We said that uh, between occupied and disturbed, we cannot differentiate with the relays because both are down. VR and PR are down in both the cases. So remote condition monitoring, uh, the data which is available with the station is accessed by another uh, equipment to bring it to the central place so that it can be shown to the users. That is the maintenance people. Because whatever error codes are shown, they are available only in the CPUs provided at the station. Uh, that is in the location box. Error code will be available. You have to go and have a look, open the location box until such time you will not be knowing. Whereas if we are able to get that, for example, here you can see, this is the reset box of one of the stations of CEL and, and at the same station you have, let us say, Gigitronics also. It is possible to access the data, that is data of the health data from uh, these boxes and then connect it to the station data logger so that it can be sent to the central place. I will show one of videos just a little later. It is like this. This is SS deck. These are the reset boxes. At any station, you can have seven, eight also reset boxes because in a junction station with uh, three, four lines. So you cannot have a different uh, interfaces to collect data for each uh, equipment. So up to eight equipments, one, equi one interface is sufficient to collect the data that is given to the station data logger and it reaches to the central place. So this is how these interface units are connected, just like this. And these are the error codes. The error codes are, there is a 33, 35, 37, 38, 39, 40. If any of these error codes are displayed, this PD-1 card has to be uh, replaced. CPU-2, CPU-1, like this, like RD-2, 44 and 42. These are the two uh, ones like this. So this diagram will be helpful uh, in case of troubleshooting. And these are all provided actually in the manual. And this is for the other one. This is for the CLX one. So then as I have already shown uh, before, the each code, what and uh, what is to be done, how to rectify, what action has to be taken. Uh, this is not available in the same form. I have just prepared it uh, for uh, showing to you. So uh, as I was telling, these are the relays VR1, VR2, PR1, PR2. These are uh, available in the location. They are brought to the center place as VPRs. This is the mainly the interface circuit and they can be used wherever they are required. Like they can be used for the block instrument. Yeah, this I think I will not cover, that is not it. This completes the presentation, but I have one item uh, which has to be shown about the uh, how the remote condition monitoring thing works. Just one second.
Yeah. So here in this diagram, you are seeing uh, SS deck on both the ends of the two stations. And there is the interface provided in the station and then which provides the data to the diagnostic data of SS deck to this data logger. Each end has a separate uh, interface because both are maybe 10 kilometers away. Let us see how it uh, functions. Let us say wheel sensor has failed. Now that information is sent as a diagnostic data to the interface. And then from here through the data logger, it reaches to the test room and then gives the alarm. Similarly, SS DAC, some failure has occurred. Again, it sends the same data to the DSC interface. From here through data logger, it reaches to the central location test room and then it provides the SMS. Then the other failure, what type of failure we get is about the communication medium. These are the three uh, areas where uh, the failures can occur. So I have taken them just for uh, showing it to you. Failure can be internal also. This system is provided at number of stations um, and being sent as SMS also to the users. So this completes my uh, presentation. Yeah. Any doubts we can? Mm, there were the last few doubts that asked by some people here. I'll be just going through that. Yeah, please. How 48 volts is generated for reset? Pardon? Uh, Mr. Malik, uh, uh, Malikia has asked, Jagadish Malikia has asked, how 48 volts is generated for reset? Yeah, it is generated uh, from the 24 volt DC power supply by uh, 48 volt DC supply is taken in the reset box, 24 volt DC, which is applied, uh, which is available as a bus bar. From there, 48 volt DC is generated and it is always available. But only thing is, it has to reach system one and system two only when conditions are suitable. What are those conditions? Number one, this one of the axial counters must have failed. And that generates this RTSR relay to pick up for a time of five seconds only. Just for five seconds, it picks up. During that five seconds, 48 volt DC travels from the station to the location and at the location again there are two paths to the system one and system two it's vital relay and the preparatory relay both are to be down then only 48 volt dc will be applied to the system whichever system because both the systems are there one of the systems if it is up it won't be applied so 48 volt dc is generated by electronic a DC DC converter in the reset box, and it is extended by proving these conditions by two wires to the location. I think it is clear. Yes, sir. Now the next question is from Vinod Mina. Please clarify the hard preparatory and conditional reset and in which conditions they are used. Yeah. Yeah, these are good questions. I will try to go to that place where I, have, I think it is before. See, normally, names. While looking at the names, we have to be careful about the words. We will see the signal engineering manual. That is the most uh, authentic. Uh, 
preparatory reset you can see in the block section automatic section ib signaling section type of reset is preparatory reset who has to do on duty asm at both ends of the block section what happens in the preparatory reset we know that the if equipment is all right it goes into uh, preparatory mode after passes of the first train only we can take off the signal if it shows clear so preparatory reset is the word used here within the station main line and run through lines again here preparatory reset on duty asm and another operating staff you need not be the asm because you cannot have two asms in the station it used to be a big problem previously <laughs> that equal person has to brought and uh, snt fellow has to be brought now it is made very clear in the new scm that operating person and same way it is done what is conditional reset conditional reset is this is hard reset that means immediately it changes uh, to the clear mode on duty asm and another operating staff this another operating staff what he does uh, is that uh, he goes to that particular place and there is a thing called line verification box he presses that button because it is the condition is lv button has to be pressed line verification button has to be pressed by another person in the field is the condition that is why it is called conditional reset i think i am clear yes sir now our next question from jagdish how many core quad required for one dp yeah when you are uh, talking about dp detection point you are calling i think you are talking about ms deck yeah yeah we will sir tomorrow tomorrow we will answer theek hai sir and any minimum... because it has lot of implications tomorrow we will see and normally see normally anywhere uh, when you say dp detection point wheel sensor plus electronics is called the many place many times dp Okay. if we are talking about just the wheel sensors take it as tx two wires rx two wires but you need not worry about that because the manufacturer himself supplies along with the coil it okay. comes as a uh, packed one yeah uh, the same person has asked another question any minimum criteria for placement of axle counter from single uh, signal or groove joint srj from signal yeah. from groove joint from yeah. srj yeah yeah normally what is that impacts let us go into the reason that some answer can be given for that but i don't want to uh why we do this number 1 if you are using if you are saying that glued joint and uh, axle counter uh, wheel detector that means you are monitoring both that means two train detection systems you are using for the same section in that case the wheel detector has to be as an error to the block joint as possible normally if i remember correct it was kept as about 2 meters not more than that second one about the srj or the joints normally the current consideration there is the vibrations if a loose joint is there by the side of the loose joint if you connect this they get subjected to the vibrations because of that they get disturbed in fact if you i don't know whether you people know or not the fresher when it entered indian railways on central railway suburban they provided and uh, they the day one itself they started breaking their uh, uh, what you call those uh, fixing bolts because of the tremendous amount of uh, vibrations caused by the track unlike in europe 
they they because their system was designed for the europe again they have to redesign it they took more than a year actually so that also exactly the indian railways decision really today i do not know that you can refer but the consideration is that okay sir then mr sunil kumar asked how resetting of axle counter ssdac will be done for distributed cabins if my axle counter is present at siding now <clears throat> wherever you may be keeping your counting point see complete electronics other than the reset portion fail safe electronics is 5 meters or 10 meters from the wheel counting point wheel sensor you have to lay cable from the place where you your reset box is kept up to that position for the resetting purpose because you have to carry 48 volt dc to that place so that is for the manual reset we have to uh do that you have to lay cable from that cabin to that place in right. case if you are using let us say uh, between the two cabins then both ends you have to provide and reset is done for each end yeah i think that i have missed it to tell Re when reset is done reset is reset has to be done at the both the ends one end reset will not be sufficient because single section digital axle counter has a two ends one end is with one station master other end is with other station master if one station master applies for the reset and 48 volts is applied still the reset won't be accepted by that end unless the other end also done the same thing and it sends the packet yes i am also ready for reset that is it okay sir uh, jagadish has asked another question here can i use one end cl make and uh, other end station some other make no it cannot be because all these electronic uh, systems equipments are proprietary uh, protocols they have they have their own designs but they follow the standard of the senelec so but the thing is component subsystem wise it is not possible to uh, make use of them like that yeah oh mr rao iftar has asked which system is better parallel or series which is to be followed parallel or series yeah i have not understood mm, okay sir we'll uh, we'll i will i will i will i will try to clarify if there is a confusion normally in series we don't use other than for safety reason for the same track section block section let us say we have provided two axle counters if we prove them in series even if any one of them fails your block section will not be available for running the trains your axle counter uh, overall section shows occupied that is used only for the purpose of safety purpose unless both of them shows clear uh, i shall not it shall not be shown as clear that is ensured by the silfor um, uh, certificate of the axle counter one system itself our problem is in case if one of if that one axle counter which is provided if it fails if one of the sensor has failed or its cpu has failed what happens the block section fails that is why we are providing a second axle counter that is we are calling it high availability ssd yeah right sir mr nazir has asked why we are using two types of frequencies not required at all not required it can be same frequencies see it is a question of the design say so somebody wants to differentiate a and b by frequency also then it is an additional precaution they are taking it for example uh, i think siemens 
tomorrow we are going to cover that it takes i think only one uh, signal 43 kilohertz or something like that it depends on the design okay sir then comes um, one uh, shivsai has asked how much voltage is applied on transmitter coil to produce magnetic flux it is about 30 volts 30 volts cc it is about this okay and on the other end you get about uh, maybe 500 millivolts or 600 millivolts something like that. Um, Mr. Sakit Kumar has asked, is interface with data logger support for remote monitoring by SSDAC, MSDAC, HA, SSDAC, UFSBA, and at the same station? No, please, kindly repeat again. Perfect. Is interface with data logger support for remote monitoring by SSDAC, MSDAC? Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah actually, any processor based system, any processor based, based system, electronic interlocking, uh, actual counters, even IPS, IPS also is a processor based system. They keep, they log and then keep their uh, diagnostic data inside. Now, to bring it out, what I have used the word interface is an equipment which understands the language of the protocol of that particular make axle counter and converts it into the understandable things like uh, it, there, there will be zeros and ones actually. It will not be error code number 35. It is not like that. It will not be in English in the data. It is zeros and ones. But we have to show outside, ultimately, when you send SMS, it has to be error code 35. Now, that conversion has to be done equipment by equipment by working with the OEMs. For example, in Ftronics, we worked with uh, Gigitronics and CEL for more than one year to get this uh, interface developed. We are working with Frasher and uh, Siemens to bring their diagnostic data also. And now, uh, Gigitronics also is asking for their MS stack. So it cannot be a single equipment. Yeah. Right, sir. Uh, sir, Katakam has asked, uh, only 48 volts is used for research. Can you use other voltage? No, it is designed like that, actually. Uh, I think, uh, 48 volts is designed. Right, sir. Uh, if the car and no a... other supply has to be applied because if you try to apply this other supply, it may damage actually. Right, sir. Um, if the car has asked like, any rule for placement of DP at station section. Any rule for uh, the placement of DP at station section. <clears throat> I have not understood that. Uh, normally, see, uh, like in the first, one of the first questions what uh, I have answered, if you are using axle counter above the DC track circuit, which is already working, it has to be as near to the log joint as possible. And uh, if you are using it without any axle counter, uh, that is without any DC track circuit, you are using it independently. Then you have to keep it just like the Indian Railways nowadays has, I think, uh, um, start a signal within three meters, you have to provide a block joint, I think. So yes, the same, same principles are to be followed. I just see. like uh, borders of uh, track circuits can be the place for the uh, borders of the track circuits can be placed for the DPs. There is no requirement for the intermediate block joints uh, where we have to cut the rails uh, at the point zone for the sake of uh, series uh, rail working. Yeah. Right. So, Santosh has asked which type of relays used for VR and PR? Normal Q style relays, QN1, but uh, 1000 ohms relay, 24 volt DC. 
fracture. If you cut the heart, it reaches the maximum distance between SF and EF. What is the maximum? Distance between SF and EF. Ha. Yeah. Practically, with, with the usage of the other communication medium, there is no limit really. If you are using it only uh, the quad cable, then your limit comes. If you are using wise, uh, wise uh, uh, channel of OFC, or if you are using uh, other uh, E1 channels, there is no limit at all. Whereas if you are using copper cable, it is limited actually. It is limited to, I think 20 dB is the uh, loss, not more than 20 kilometers. Right, sir. Mm. Why earthing is the requirement for SSDAC? Earthing? Yes, sir. See, basically, earthing is used wherever you want to take the surges down uh, into the earth. So whether it is a data cable or it is the power cable, wherever copper enters into the box segment, you have to take it down. Yeah. Uh, Shiva has asked uh, station A and station B are you? Yeah, sorry, I again, again, I will clarify that. Uh, and if the earth is not available, it cannot be dissipated in the SPDs actually. Energy still remains uh, on the line itself. That is why you have to take it to the earth. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sh Sh Shiva Sai has asked the station A and station B are using different company actual counter. Will be there any problem for system? And are they going to compare each other? <laughs> no, station A, station B means uh, both ends are to be of the same make. If okay. there is a double line, for upline you use Gigitronics and the downline CEL, and then if there are third line you use the Thales, they can be used. There is no problem. Right. Uh, there are stations like that. Yes. And uh, Mr. Mustafa has asked, uh, will you please explain Frosher RSR-180 wheel sensor? It is connection stand working. Tomorrow. Okay, sir. Yeah, I have just shown it uh, for the purpose of this thing. Right, sir. Amit Kumar has asked, for communication purpose, which media most preferably, quad, OFC, channel, or even? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely not. C copper cable is the last one. OFC is the best one. For the purpose of influencing by the uh, induction and other uh, problems. But, Please, uh, okay. but, but maintainability, when, when maintainability comes, uh, then there can be a problem. If you are going for OFC, then OFC Failure can it be attended by a, a normal ESM that becomes a problem. E1 and all, yes, uh, they are all okay actually. Uh, as, as long as, see, the copper cable causes induction and other problems and they can cause damage to the equipment. So, copper cable shall not be used. Okay, sir. And Sushant Kumar Das has asked, kindly provide details about MSDC in future big device. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, MSDAC. Tomorrow we are going to cover that, no? Take it, sir. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Then Amit has asked, uh, what is the coder life of uh, transmitter and receiver coil? There is nothing like coder life, really. Uh, they are not uh, recommended for replacement. It is only on condition basis. Right, sir. Sura Prakash has asked, can we use Excel counter for block proving completely without block instrument? Yeah, block instrument is uh, only an interface and uh, the, the operational things. It can be done. So, see, like, for example, now, electronic interlocking itself is, uh, they are including the block logics. 
So it is a question of man machine interface, which buttons he has to press. If he has not, if you want still he has to press the buttons, then you require something there. Uh, some box like thing with buttons and our indications. If you want to take it to VDU, it can be taken to VDU. There is no problem at all. The only thing is block uh, circuit uh, has to be taken into the electronic interlocking. That's all. Right, sir. Ambrish Kumar has asked, is it possible to transmit a receiver as a one coin? Yeah, it is possible. One, it is not one coil, actually. Yeah, one uh, uh, this thing, it can be done. Yeah, actually, that's what uh, RSR 180 and other things. Tomorrow, we will cover that. Okay, sir. It's possible. Okay. Yes, sir. Durgesh has asked what is supervised uh, level voltage on uh, SSDAC module or cars? What is that? So, we supervise the supervised level voltage. Supervised level voltage. On this module cars, order modules or cars? Uh, I am not able to get it. Right. I, I will get him uh, more details, sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, damage damage reveals also count by uh, SSDAC or in future in uh, future. Damage reveals. Yeah. The axial counter cannot, but there are sensors which can uh, find out the damage reveal. The uh, dark fiber OFC, a simple OFC which is buried about half a meter by the side of the track uh, can detect uh, the pressure or whatever impact caused by this damaged wheel uh, onto the rail and then gives precisely uh, with the meters uh, within a meter uh, accuracy, but not the present angle counters. There are sensors. Right, sir. Uh, Sri Ellen Mishra has asked, how can full duplex communication happen between two ends with only half cord of cable? That is simple. Uh, we have given wires. It is happening, isn't it? <laughs> Both sides were able to talk. Okay. Uh, that, uh, that transformer, uh, with the transformer, it is possible to take out the TX and RX and combine them. That is not a difficult thing. There is all digital communications actually. It's possible. It's not difficult. Right. So Jagdish has asked if I place uh, SSDAC on berthing track, then it is required to lay cord cable from rear room to axial counter location box. We are laid cord cable from one axial counter to other um, uh, for other communication. See, if you are using uh, two DPs, if you are provided on both the, let us say, loop line or main line, whatever it is, you have to lay quad cable between the two DPs, two location boxes, and also to the station. Uh, because you, you will be having two reset boxes and uh, you require uh, the event logger data to be brought to those things, to the reset boxes. So one pair of communication cable is required from each DP to the reset box. That is the requirement. Okay, sir. Sudhir has asked after train enters into block section, at that time we are using preparatory reset or not? Preparatory reset has to be applied when the section is vacant. In the failed condition, section is vacant. At that time, preparatory reset has to be applied. When preparatory reset is applied, if the equipment hardware failure is not there and the communication and other failures are not there, it changes to preparatory reset mode, PR relay picks up. In case there is a hardware failure, it won't respond. It won't change to preparatory reset mode. 
now only train has to enter into the section when a train enter into the section the axle counter just functions like a normal axle counter after the train vacating the section it shows clear then you can make use of it let us say when the section is occupied if you apply the preparatory reset if there is no hardware failure it may reach preparatory reset mode but when it exits again it fails it won't show uh, clear after preparatory reset only the exit is taking place entry entry should happen and then exit it gives some error codes okay sir i think uh, we can a uh, few more questions are there i hope we'll, we can take it uh, tomorrow probably now it's already yeah. two and a half hours you are talking and i don't want to do <laughs> tax you further more so i will save this uh, uh, chat and yeah. definitely we, we can take it tomorrow no problem yeah yeah thanks sir. thanks a lot nice. again join tomorrow at 7:00 uh, uh, thank you yeah. all participants please join tomorrow at uh, Seven o'clock, please. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Thanks.